Hello, everyone. I hope, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you for joining us for this lecture with Corday Henry. Uh, I also want to make a note that today our Penn community is uh, weighed down by the tragic death of Walter Wallace Jr. here in West Philadelphia. Um, I quote a CNN article here, uh, the police shooting of Walter Wallace Jr is just the latest instance of police officers using violence against the uh, black community who are disproportionate, disproportionately targeted by law enforcement. Um, but we're also here to welcome back a very talented designer, artist, and filmmaker who graduated from Penn not long ago. Uh, Corday Henry is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker and visual artist working between the real and the virtual to explore new worlds through mythology and the Black intonation. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania with a dual degree in architecture and landscape architecture, Corday joined the Mass Design Group to design the first memorial to lynching in America for the Equal Justice Initiative. After the opening of the Memorial for Justice and Peace, he went on to complete a Master's of Arts in Fiction and Entertainment at SciArc in Los Angeles in 2019. His postgraduate thesis film entitled Earth Mother, Sky Father led him to take the stage at the 2019 Design Indaba Conference, being a nominee for the SHOTS 2020 New Director of the Year Residency, the Sundance New Frontier Program, and is now exhibiting the work in art houses in Mexico, South Africa, Europe, and here in the US. Currently, Corday is directing music films, teaching at SciArc, and is a fellow at Onyx Studio. Within his fellowship, he is working to reconstruct a real-time performance exploring the past, present, and future of the Black body through ceremony. On a personal note, I just want to say Corday was a student of mine in several courses. He was one of my first research assistants as well as an employee. I've watched his rise as a young designer so full of talent and am pleased that I can welcome Corday back now as a friend and equal. I'll take, turn it over to Corday. Please join me in thanking him and welcoming him to this. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. You know, uh, Sam has been a, a big, huge advocate of mine, and mentor of mine for a long time. So kind of coming back here is like a full circle. And uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So I originally planned on uh, really starting this presentation off. Uh, I like to think of this as a DJ session, DJ session, less less of a lecture, but uh, I wanted to start this off differently, um, just in the nature of what's happening in the world, what the conversation is. Uh, so I'm going to show uh, a quick, short excerpt of this project that I'm working on called God's Work. Uh, it's in my attempt to create a link to my own Jamaican American British diaspora. I find this film as a gateway to fill in the gaps that was long under underseen. Uh, God's Work is an interstellar journey that pirates the internet, tethering directly to the notion that matter is always in a state of flux, as an effort to remake itself in a state of metamorphosis. We find a resurgence of pain, drama, joy, violence, all in the movement. The film is a sort of recontextualization of the way we see work and what we feel when the body quantum leaps into a collapsed waveform, which I'll talk about. It's really inspired by Broke Up Style, which is migrated from Jamaica by the way of Greg Adams, who was in his performance piece. And uh, his DNA has really infiltrated the world through, through dance, starting from the early 90s. So with this film, I was really excited about uh, this starkness of this gathering, uh, where Greg Adams it comes to light, illuminating across the terrain with Black bodies, uplifting, uplifting the Black gaze in which he stands upon the Black night. Um, I was really fascinated by this idea. And I think it speaks to some of the things that I've um, I'm going to share with you today. Uh, this, this image that you're looking at in the background is created by Mink Smith, where she photographs Sun Ra, you know, the prolific Sun Ra as a moving image. 
I think this is the way you can, this, I think this might be the only way you really can actually capture Sun Ra in its like pure essence and form as a musician, an artist, and being. Um, the title of this session is a Collapse of Waveform, which is a notion uh, that a mentor of mine from the Sunday's New Frontier program, uh, Sharif Lo, came up with. And really it's about uh, connecting two points in time, right? And folding them in um, to make something new. And I think this is a quantum physics term, right? Uh, really, really about space and time. Um, and I'm gonna show something else. Uh, so it's like a back-to-back -back double feature. So I'm gonna show something else that really starts to speak to that idea. Oh, you see me like a UFO That's like These are some of the ideas that I've been wrestling with, you know, uh, uh, the connection between the black body and landscapes, um, or the, the connection to the black body and movement. Um, what do these things look like uh, when, when held against another image, you know, much like the works of AJ, um, which I'm really inspired by. And um, we can think of this as combining terms too, like things that maybe seem opposed to each other, like what is the real and the virtual look like? Um, what does fact fiction or technology mythology um, really look like? And how does that all relate to collapsing of this waveform or two moments in time in history? Um, I immediately think about Janet Lawson's work. Um, she's a photographer in New York and she really is trying to explore what she calls the black familiar. And she transforms observational pictures, right? into like these powerful modalities of expression, critique, and celebration. Uh, and I'm really fascinated behind this idea and how that feeds into her work uh, exploring what does global histories and traditions look like? Um, what does romance 
and instant and intimacy look like in the flat space? And how does that make space for ritual and spirituality? Uh, and also, it's, you know, also hard on Kerry James Marshall's work uh, and the way he deals with the image and darkness and uh, really for me speaks to a futurity and a mysticism that's invited into the photograph, that's invited into the spaces that he creates and uh, how these images are really about uh, work, right? I think there's a quote about him, like this isn't magic, it's information and it's work. And that's what we see in these images and how can these things that we make also be a form of information? Uh, these are just some of the things that I've been wrestling with uh, and really pointing to this, like how are we reimagining the narrative of the black body. Um, if we think about uh, one of the most influential diagrams of the black body, it's actually this diagram, right? Uh, this Brook slave ship from 1781, where uh, each body is represented as a, as a piece of technology, an object amongst a sea of other objects, right? And this is a really powerful notion because what we actually find is that in this diagram, the centuries of history, culture, design, agriculture, language, medicine, theory, all bounded up inside of a single human vessel, right? They can't take objects uh, when, they, when they leave, uh, when, they, when they're taken from um, uh, the continent of Africa, right? It's all embodied in the body. So with this notion, um, the body becomes a, a zip drive, right? To quote my friend Jeremy. Uh, and so how do we how do we unpack that? And I think Ming Smith does this in the most effortless, effortless way, right? You know, as this image embodies all the kingdom ships, um, all the beauty and pain, all in one image is a constellation. So uh, I've been really fascinated by some Ming Smith images, uh, which, which also leads me to uh, Terry Atkins, um, the late and great Terry Atkins. Uh, I, I remember the first time and the only time I met Terry, which was at Penn, and I was in a screen printing room, uh, um, and I was making a screen print, uh, print, etching it on copper, and it was like 2 a.m., it was really late, and I didn't, I didn't expect anybody else to be there, and uh, Terry, Terry showed up, and I seen him around the school, because there's only so many uh, Black faculty members, so, seen him around and uh, we had a small conversation um, and at the time he was trying to tell me something along the lines of this. Uh, I try to make these material things as immediate and ethereal as music and the music I pursued. I try to make it as visceral and physical almost approaching matter. Trying to make both other things do what they naturally are not inclined to do was a challenge. And this is something that I, I'm still, think, still thinking about six years later. I'm still trying to like wrap my head around, like how do we make music into matter? Uh, it's just one of the questions that I've been thinking about. And when I look at uh, Paul Pfeiffer's work, I immediately think of like, this, this is an image by Paul Pfeiffer. Um, it's called The Four Horsemen uh, of the Apocalypse, which seamlessly transforms the stadium into a spectacle. He weaves mythology and the black body at the center of this entire conversation as he meticulously removes all the details of the game and of the player, right? You don't see uh, the number, you don't see the team, uh, you don't even see the hoop, right? You don't even see the basketball, everything's removed. And all we're left with is the black body in the center, removed from its context, floating in midair, both as a form of celebration and tragedy. So. I've been really fascinated and kind of enamored really by Paul Pfeiffer's images. Um, and also uh, his exploration of, of Michael Jackson, um, the way he transforms Michael's uh, moonwalk into a sort of mutation is, is fascinating to me. Um, it really uh, plays on the way we, we, the way we see things and how we can change the way observers see right, just through the image itself, um, just the way we interpret the data. So I've been really fascinated by, by the way Paul Pfeiffer has been able to collapse his own waveform. Um, I also can think of like Rim LZ, who was a visual artist and painter, who I was really 
thinking about when I was uh, designing and creating and directing this film, Earth Among the Sky Father, that I'll show you today, uh, I was really fascinated uh, by his ability to continuously world build through his costumes, through this far right image of his graffiti work, all of it played into this like world creation that he was building. So I'm really, I was really fascinated behind that. Um, and with this, even with this image, I can like smell the funk and sweat in the room as he builds each costume, right? You could feel it, uh, that the, the labor that he put into this idea of Gothic futurism, uh, assembling objects uh, found on the street, right? It's really a re resemblance of like how hip hop functions. Um, so I've been fascinated with how he's just created this whole world in his room filled with objects that act as, act as like proxies to other identities uh, that he occupies. Um, so I've really been fascinated behind this idea um, of, of black technology, uh, which is a term from a federal, uh, full metal panic, which is an anime, which came with this term called black, black technology, uh, which really is about uh, this far more advanced uh, real world or this real or this new technology that's more advanced than the ones that we consistently see. And so when we think of, about artificial intelligence, this plays into a sort of black technology. And at the time when I was creating the film Earth Mother's Godfather, I started to just look at everyday devices that we use, such as our cell phones, uh, and start and start to look at what's behind the screen, right? Uh, to dig deeper on, on, in this image. Like how do we use technology? Who's using technology? And through my research, I found out that 16% uh, of the world's precious coltan is excavated by hand in the Congo. And the automat automatically, something started to trigger. It was like, OK, these are, these are black hands that are touching the technology before it's even labeled technology. Um, and just to clear things up, uh, coltan and tantalum are two minerals that essentially uh, power every single electronic that we use every single day. It, it, it's able to uh, allow electrical signals to flow through these devices easier, right? Um, just that idea already starts to think of movement and performance for me, at least. Um, so this is this is what happens when we melt down all those objects that we find in the earth, uh, uncovered on the black hands. Um, I then later found this quote uh, from this New York Times article that said, "What if we could harness?" The desperation for new technologies, the desperate need to curb the killing in Central Africa, uh, and I was started like ask my own questions, like, uh, what if we could reimagine the narrative of technology? Very simply, right? um, one that puts the stories of ritual and black culture at the forefront of a new future. What would that look like? Uh, and uh, this became my response, which is Earth Among the Sky So this project was made in about a year and a half um, of uh, work within the SIR uh, program, uh, Fiction Entertainment. Uh, and uh, through that year, I was asking a lot of these questions, just trying to come up with, with thoughts around uh, the body and technology and trying to figure out that relationship that with these objects that I use every single day. Um, There's this quote by Amar Kumbar that goes, uh, Sometimes the future is the past and the past the present, which uh, I think a lot of my work tends to do is, is kind of archive things and try to look back 
to C4, which is another idea that um, started in Ghana uh, from the Sankofa bird, right? It's this image that you see of this bird uh, looking backwards as a way to look forwards. Um, and, and I've just been like using these type of ideas to uh, you know, speak to a sort of relationship towards the future and maybe about things that I've, I've envisioned are happening in that near future outside of the Western gates, right? Um, what does that look like? Um, and just really trying to imagine in that space. Um, uh, throughout the film, I was really researching heavily uh, this, the Kuba tribe, which is found in the Congo currently. Uh, and I was really inspired by some of the masquerades that take place uh, and the meaning behind those, right? Those, those objects, those emblematic, royal, powerful, prestige, you know, costumes that they wear. Uh, we're looking at a um, wash and boy mask here. And I just love the idea how um, they kind of create their own kind of ceremonies around this, around these ideas of what, what who God is and who, who uh, are and start to build our own relationships towards uh, who the body who the body is, like who are we uh, in relationship to the earth, right? So I've, been, I've just been really inspired by some of these ideas. Um, also the Lukenge mask, uh, which if you see it has these cowrie shells, which really at that time, it was a form of currency, right? So uh, this mask is, is endowed with, with money, right? With currency, with a form of, of wealth. And I think a lot of the work has been trying to embody just this mask in itself. Like how do we, how do we create uh, new value systems that are driven by the black body? Uh, so essentially, uh, that's that's what that's what all this work really is about to me. Um, and so through that process, I started to just like put these images together of, of uh, this convergence of black culture, technology, and movement. And I was just really asking, you know, can those things have a conversation? Um, that's not uh, totally didactic, but that's that ranges in the spectrum of a world that we just entered, right? One of the one of the things that I made, one of the images, the first images that I made was this, um, where I took um, some LA-based crump dancing. This is a uh, Carlo Lizzi, aka Worm, performing right here on the left, and on the right, there's these large excavation machines that's uh, larger than the body, right? Things that we don't necessarily equate to to one to one scale of the human body. So again, I was just really asking these questions, like, can they speak to each other? Is there a relationship? Um, and I'm still asking those questions today. Uh, I was really investigating the Kuba tribe, um, mainly from their tradition of, of the Umbun, which is a sky father who kind of lit up the dark and spewed out the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, and really, it's, it's, a, it's really a homage or a connection between uh, creation, right? Like essentially Earth Mother Sky Father is a creation story. And um, and again, I was trying to have that conversation with the existing tribe and um, black culture in America and how those things can kind of coexist and uh, create a piece of work. Uh, on the left is the this CGI God creature that I designed and created. And on the right is uh, this excavation arm that we see and um, I wanted to really start to uh, reimagine these machines, right? Like, uh, what would that black technology look like, um, and how would how would how would we transform? How would I transform? Essentially, uh, so that's what we're seeing on the far right, on the far left. Um, and I started to look look up why these machines are yellow, like why the color is even yellow, right? And I found out that you know a lot of these machines are yellow because of reposmentisms, you know, things that we. Uh, generally correlate with fear, right? Um, oh, this, this, this frog is actually poisonous. Uh, so I love that idea and that connection between, uh, between God, between spirit. Uh, sometimes it's something we, that, that we fear. Uh, sometimes it's something that we, we handle with grace. Uh, we're not really sure it's in this in-between space. Um, and I love that representation of, of, of God itself as a, as a character. I was also looking into uh, a lot of the sculptures and objects that they were creating uh, 
this is a Kissy sculpture on the far right, and really, it's a constitution. It's a physical constitution. Uh, each each nail that's embedded into this body is essentially a, a law. Um, and I love this idea of, of just this representation of a declaration of the body, uh, and how that could be represented in terms of a, a scene. Right. So on the far left, there's a scene where the machine is essentially being combined, right, and uh, being put together. I love this idea. So a lot of it was really inspired by this Kissy sculpture that we see in the far right. In the film, I ended up designing an entire language for it, uh, entire alphabet for it, really inspired by these uh, textiles that we see in the far right, uh, these bold text textiles. Um, and really, it's a series of textiles that say variations of, of Woot, right? Woot is the, um, it was created by God, essentially, in the Kupa tribe. And, uh, and so there's definitely different uh, overlapping and weaving and complex knotted forms that really, for me, uh, spoke to a certain level of like cultural knowledge and to understand that um, the cultural knowledge is embedded into the fabric. It's embedded into everything that they make, uh, forming and knotting and crossing and returning uh, all throughout the just, you know, the textiles and what they wear. And so I was really inspired by that to create a certain language for the project. Uh, so on the far left is a piece of the alphabet um, that I created for the project. Um, and what I, what I also love is how, even on the architecture itself, uh, in the Congo, you know, uh, in the Kupa tribe, you'll see how those, those graphics, right? It's just called the graphics, uh, representations of meaning is embedded not only into the fabric, but it, leaves the fabric, it leaves the body and it beds itself onto the architecture itself. Um, so a lot of these ideas I'm just I was just playing with and trying to wrestle with and to figure out how that can be also embedded into uh, this creature, into the landscape, or into uh, storyboard Pete's body as he moves as well. You'll see the marker there. Um, and uh, on the right uh, is an image of fiducial markers. and. Uh, and really, it's playing off of the traditional Kuba textiles, right? And how that, there's information there. And uh, on the right, these fiducial markers are basically how machines communicate to one another, right? Um, if you think of like QR codes, things like that, um, those are just different ways in which we communicate. Uh, like body language is a way of communicating. And I was essentially trying to get away from just text-based information and how movement has a lot of information embedded into it. Uh, in a lot of ways, could be more valuable if we looked at it different. You know, so um, a lot of the work is kind of pulling from these ideas. Uh, I now want to kind of show some new work, which I'm not sure if I should do. But uh, it's uh, this year I joined Onyx, uh, which is a collaboration between Onesis and New Ink. Um, to re really reimagine in this, this new world in 2050. So the last project was in 2030. Uh, so this project with, with Onyx is going to be a, a live performance, essentially, um, using some new technologies that engage the body quite directly. Um, so I'm really exploring new tools with this project. Uh, and one of the ideas is, uh, we, where we once were mining the ground for rare earth minerals, uh, we are now looking to, to space to harvest other planets for new technology. Uh, I was really fascinated with this idea that, um, you know, our bodies essentially can eventually leave this planet and occupy different spaces and subject positions and environments. Uh, and really pulling from the Dogon tribe found in Mali, which has already predicted a serious B planet that we see on the far right, right? It knew its colors, knew its size, they knew, they knew a lot of facts about it way before the technology even existed, right? So I was really in love with this idea that there's already a spiritual connection to, to space, to, uh, to, uh, to astronomy, you know, to things outside of, uh, of our own bodies, um, and, and we can occupy those spaces as well. So this new project is heavily looking into virtual production, which is essentially uh, what they use on Mandalorian 
which is these uh, full LED screens that are projecting this uh, video game environment, right? To blend together the real and the virtual. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I've been investigating these tools and trying to figure out what does this mean for cinema? How can we uh, design a live installation um, that allows us to occupy the space and occupy the space of the actor at all in real time? I've been also looking at um, motion capture as a way to kind of engage the body quite directly when we talk about virtual spaces uh, and how uh, this can translate into information, right? T transmit, trans translate into new forms of storytelling. Um, so here's a couple of uh, iterations of just like uh, screens, like essentially this kind of panoptic screen and how conceptually how the body could engage with this. Um, so here's just a few iterations of just what we've been thinking about uh, in the Sundance New Frontier Lab and now at ONX. Um, and uh, even if the project could be in the round, right? What would that mean to occupy a full cipher, you know, and how would that virtual environment uh, begin to have a conversation directly with our own bodies uh, as a live installation. So uh, I'm just going to show you kind of work in progress that I've been working on uh, within ONX um, to give you a sense of like where the work is going and where it potentially could go. I, more than anything, I feel just blessed to be able to be doing what I do and to be alive and experience it and hopefully share that enthusiasm and joy that I feel. This is for my favorite band, the human beings, the faithful, the graceful, the tragic, and the classic, the evidence of things unseen, the book of light, the mansions of the moon, the bones of Fir'aun, recently discovered in everything but no. The doubt is doubts about it, never made it untrue. Life, the gift, peace after pressure. Can't remember how you came and went and bet on how you'll exit from the start. The only thing certain is the end. Promise to all and none know not when. Heartbreak from yesterday's and fret for tomorrow. I leave today filled with anxiety and hollow. If you pray, don't worry. If you worry, don't pray. I got that from Umi. It's a poem I heard it say. From the tall palace walls to the mean teeth streets, I hope you get what you want and that you want what you need. Amen. So much beauty we forget to be reminded that you can be anywhere and find it. So much beauty we forget then get reminded that you can be anywhere everywhere and find it. So uh, I invite any questions, any ideas, any thoughts. Um, you know, I thank you everyone for, for dropping in to my bedroom and just kind of listening to uh, what I've been working on, what I've been thinking about uh, and uh, what's yet to come. So. Corday, um, thank you so much. What a epic introduction to an enormous world, you no, know, and a, a world of, uh, I believe, the human, the non-human, the late capitalists, the post-industrial, uh, and also very much the kind of retroactive manifesto of future world building for. Uh, for African Americans and and the Black community across the world, I I st I am in awe of what I just saw tonight. I um, have a few questions, but I will actually go straight to the questions from the audience because they have been very vocal. Uh, from going, this is I think one real person wrote this is dope when you were showing your uh, Sky Father Earth Mother. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, 
Um, sorry, the name doesn't fully show up. I'm going to try to stretch my screen so I can see who. From Abrar Alte is asking, and this is going to be more towards the technical side of things. Do the cameras that you use have to be at a very high refresh rate, or is it a refresh rate that syncs um, with the camera? And I'm guessing he's talking about your animations as well. Yeah, I mean, I think when we speak about digital space, uh, you can manipulate the camera in any way as you need to. Um, you know, when you think about traditional games, they're working at 60 frames per second, and cinema's working at 24. So we can oscillate between the two uh, to essentially create you know, more cinematic experiences if we're working for 24, but if we're looking for something that's uh, more game-like, we work at 60. Uh, so, I mean, these are all things that we've been talking about and exploring in terms of like, how do we have that conversation with cinema and live performance? Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, this leads to something, a question of mine is, um, when you have your, let's call it, uh, I, I love what you were saying about there's black culture, there's technology, and there's movement. And in the movement, which is the shared transaction between the human and then the God figure, um, is there a method that you just developed to suggest that for humans, we have a certain physiognomy, we have an axis of symmetry, right? Two arms, two legs, no tail. Our ears don't move that much. But yet when we have the non-human, which is the God figure uh, that has several arms. In fact, I would imagine that your uh, protagonist in the first movie could assemble any number of arms as he saw fit. Uh, did you have a method in which you were saying that there can be uh, grace, dance, and violence that can be embodied in the five-legged machine, the 20-armed uh, uh, mythical figure, and how you would start to uh, produce flow and motion from that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think a lot of the, the images that I was looking at at the time, you know, through my archive, just images, um, that directly relate to the Kuba tribe, you know, were about trying to reference that, like these, these amazing masks that they were creating and the objects that they were creating in that space. Um, so the work was very much about um, speaking to that in a certain what type of way. So in terms of like, oh, is it going to have five legs or six legs? And what does that mean in terms of uh, the relationship with the performance? Uh, really just depends on the references that I was pulling from and you know, as I was trying to connect to. Um, but you're right, you know, God could have many different uh, ways of thinking. So it, in, in part of the process of making the creature, I went through maybe 20 different iterations that, that I didn't show that actually are like other outlets of like how this kind of guy could be arranged. So a lot of it was um, just cerebral and just kind of trying to figure out what the language of God might be in the term of, in the same terms of technology, what would that look like? Um, so a lot of it is just like this haptic response to, to what images I'm seeing, uh, to what the performance artist is doing, uh, and then how that all kind of comes together. Yeah. And certainly that starts going towards what you're producing now at your uh, ONX fellowship, where now it's turning into what I would say looks more towards the, the communal experience, right? You had your uh, it looked like three rooms concatenated, right? So you can travel from, I would imagine, from world to world to world. Um, and in what way, because I stand entranced by how you are producing a kind of a new Afrofuturism to play out all forms of narrative, right? To say that the, that the, uh, that the Democratic Republic of Congo decided they weren't going to have their rare earth being shipped overseas anymore. They would harvest it for themselves to give themselves an identity and a place in modern technology. I would, I would ask um, how you're starting to see that with uh, the suggestion that the camera is no longer the primary means of seeing everything, but now you have a shared rooms upon rooms where people can go and find their, their own trajectories, let's say. Yeah, I think I think the, the new work is really responding to the need to involve the body in some way or form. And uh, whether that's the performer that's like really right up against you as you move, right? As you're as you're walking around the space, or the screen becomes the performer in a certain type of way. 
So I think the work is really responding to uh, this need to kind of engage the body as a part of the rhetoric of the work. And so that's why I've been investigating, like what, what can motion capture technology actually provide us a space to explore, uh, you know, black cinema, you know, black cinematic, you know, um, is that a, is that a language that we can use? Uh, a lot of it is just asking these kind of early questions and investigating and, and really just trying to see, see if there's space there. Fantastic. I am actually holding back a floodgate of questions from the audience. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pivot towards what I've been seeing popping up on screen. Uh, so this is from uh, Maria Fuentes, uh, who says, beautiful work, Corde. I was wondering if you could expand on what performance art and cinema in specific means to you and how the affect of it is different from something like drawings or renderings that we typically produce as architecture students and what that transition was like for your work. That's a great question. I'm not sure if I know how to answer that. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, th I think Fred Moten has, a, you know, a really good language around uh, performance and cinema and uh, the non non performance. And I, that's kind of how I really see it. I use the word performance, but I'm really talking about non performance, like non not performing for anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the worlds are like, um, you know, uh, I don't explain too much. I might give some exposition, but you're immediately in the world, right? You know, we're not seeing an entire backstory. We're just embedded in, into it, which is a lot of Sadia Hartman's work. You know, she she investigates worlds where you're already in it. So I think I'm really interested in a cinema that looks like that, um, that investigates those same type of like um, language for, for Black expression without explaining too much. You're just in the world. Um, so I think I'm, I'm really interested in that. Fantastic. Um, so there is a question now from uh, Urchigral Us Usal, uh, who says, I uh, love your work, Corday, as do I. Um, what are some things that draw you to movement as a medium of expression? There are many outlets, music, painting, etc., with each strengths of their own in their richness of expression. Uh, in which ways does movement inspire you, uh, perhaps more than or different from other mediums of expression? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, movement is, um, is in a lot of ways responsive to me. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reaction you're having to uh, music, essentially, and or sound. And uh, I think I've been really interested on, uh, you know, the way AJ thinks about sound and the way um, RPJ Joplin thinks about sound and the way uh, Terry Atkins thinks about sound um, and, that, and then how that connects to other forms, right, of, of physical being. And so I've been really fascinated just by, just by movement and Black movement and how um, body language is essentially uh, just another way to communicate. I mean, you can communicate through paintings, which, which you should, uh, but my, my format has been uh, movement, right? How, how do we perform through movement um, as a way to speak to kind of all of these worlds that I'm trying to create? And it is certainly your expertise and fluency in cinematography, how I've mm -hmm. seen that you frame the, the black body. So I'm in one interview you gave, you were mentioning uh, how you highlight the back and the spine of the male figure. and how that is a kind of a lead towards the vision forwards and not backwards. Yeah, exactly, 100%. I mean, yes, I mean, a lot of the shots were, you yeah, know, like trying to speak to something, like trying to head in a certain direction that, that brought value to these ideas. So that's one of the, the tactics that I use, was like shooting the back of the body, and then we're pointing towards uh, something within the landscape. So we're seeing these kind of three, three mark thresholds and we're also we're we're, occup we're also occupying the world, right? Um, so these are just some of the tactics that I've thought about in terms of like how we how we even shoot the body, essentially. I'd also say that there was it's uh, an interesting pairing of um, the body in direct contact with ground, mm -hmm. where you had very close up shots of the hand moving through the sand, or the dancers. Uh, feet in boots, kicking up 
sand, but then it would also go in reverse. So you would back up time in those frames. I, I wonder if, there's a, if there was a kind of key or motif to that for you. Yeah, I guess I, um, I've always uh, connected uh, the body to um, geological change and shift and environmental change and shift and how these things are not um, necessarily separated. You know, I think of uh, color folks as the first uh, forefathers of land, right? You know, and how they're very much uh, a part of the way we kind of envision, they should be a part of the way we envision these new futures. So a lot of the work, uh, especially the new work takes place in like large landscapes and environments. Um, and again, it's just trying to speak to some of these kind of ideas and references that I just kind of uh, think are dope and, uh, and I value. So, um, yeah. Um, if I could go to a question that's now starting to yield more towards the, um, the socioeconomic and political times. Uh, we have a question from Quentin Samuels. Uh, as we centralize the black body as an access point to new concepts of technology, well said. How do we hold in tension the challenges in negotiating Western imperialism where the black body has been commodified, as you also showed in the, in the slide of the slave ship, uh, at the expense of the body itself? And who's responsible for reframing this narrative going forward into the future? It's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer that. I mean, I think that um, I was talking to Simon earlier about this, but I think, you know, in a lot of ways, cinema is, a, is ahead of the built environment, right? So at least in my work, you know, I'm, I'm very much about the black speculation of the way we engage in technology. And the way I do it is through images, right? I make images that respond to something in hopes that, you know, uh, a shift in, in the waveform will be created. That's, that's as much as I, at least I, I can do within, within the framework of which I, which I work. But that's a really great question. To build up on what Quentin has brought forward, would you say that your work, especially in uh, emancipating and, and pairing technology into uh, what I'm calling the retroactive manifesto, that to go into the future, uh, it might be that you are, and who is responsible for reframing this narrative? I believe, um, and it, you could, you can agree, disagree, if we place you within another group of uh, artists called the Afrofuturists, where they see that there has been a kind of history and a uh, link to uh, the roots of Black Americans and to um, to renovate what those stories could mean uh, for the past and also the present and what you can face uh, for your for your future goals. If you have any kind of congruency with those who you see as the Afrofuturists, such as Nick Cave and his sound suits, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot a lot of it is about. Fugitivity and um, also about celebration and joy and all the things that we need uh, within the realms of, of, of black spaces and, and the relationships and technology and landscapes. And so a lot of the work kind of revolves around that, um, but it doesn't also like shy away from conversations of horror because I think those are also a part of our daily life. So how do we embed that? You know, in a lot of ways, Earth Mother Sky Father can be seen as a horror depending on what perspective you're looking from. So uh, for me, it's really about like embodying uh, the, the, the complexity of the world as much as we can. I think when we're at that point, when we're all understanding the complexity of it, we can uh, begin to see it, right? You can't see it if, you, if you're so far removed, if you're not in it. So I think a lot of it is, is really trying to place our, um, the viewer inside of these Right. I'm going to uh, uh, Ellen, Ellen Nasus, who you, whom you might remember from Penn Praxis and uh, LARP. Uh, she gave a great quote right now saying, as Nina Simone has said, if we have our body, we have so much. Uh, and then to talk about the body and perhaps other genders, Nicole Chang has uh, written a question to you. Thank you, Corday. Uh, would you speak a bit more about how you think about gender in relation to movement when you are world building? 
gender and movement. Wow, that's that's a really interesting one. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think that gender and movement. I don't necessarily think the movement is uh, polarized on one specific gender. You know, I look at a lot of black movement, and you might consider that to be a, a female dancing, but it's a man, or a man dancing, it's a woman. You know, or it's it's a trans, you know, transsexual, you know, it's really, um, it's really broad in, in its range of kind of speaking to a larger a complexity of what gender really is. Um, you know, what is gender? You know, am I a man or am I a woman? You know, so I think movement in the body uh, quite directly cuts through that in a very specific way by allowing folks to participate at all different levels and scales. Uh, in terms of the, the gender question. Uh, so for me, yeah, m movement just cuts through that, you know, cuts directly to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And just the way I like to explore it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, certainly, uh, if we could uh, bring in Donna Haraway to the question that you can be uh, non-binary, you can be male, you can be female, and you can also be cloaked within the layers of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. To produce uh, altogether new new beings or new new compound uh, 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 sentience, I I don't know if you want to uh, have. Do you have time for for one more question from the audience? Yeah, let's do one more. One more. Okay, thank you. So, sorry, I'm trying to find this one. Okay, uh, this one uh, is from Takahiro Suzuki, uh, who asks, you're often working with dance and treating the body as is moving architecture and language. When creating films and capturing or translating through a technological device in the camera, uh, what are the biggest challenges you encounter in trying to create a universally understood meaning or conversation? Uh, is that part of the research in making that work? Uh, I mean, a lot of it is is trying to like translate like things that are happening viscerally. Like you know, I mean, dance and movement is. I mean, it's much better if you're experiencing it live or if you're doing it yourself, right? There's something really powerful about that, and then trying to translate that onto uh, onto a screen is really, really, really hard. You know, really, really challenging. Um, something I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, I'm definitely wrestling with that um, with each project. Um, and trying to investigate what that may mean uh, in terms of language, in terms of communication, um, and, and also not non-communication, right? Sometimes things uh, can't be said, you know, and you just you just have to kind of let it kind of live and let it breathe. And I think I'm also like really interested in that as well. Like you don't always need to speak, you don't always need to say something. Um, there's many ways to kind of just kind of live within a space in an environment and let it be what it is. And so for a lot of the work, it's again, like this kind of uh, trying to understand that space uh, of both giving the audience, giving us something, that information that Carrie James Marshall, like information, but also not giving away too much. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of it is kind of trying to figure out that space. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering these questions very well, but. No, I think that was very rich. I, I would, I would also uh, add that perhaps in the communication through movement, that some things may be incommunicable or yeah. uh, or ineffable in meaning that, or or the 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 value is constantly changing. Perhaps from male, female, non-binary, machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that you feel. I think I'm, I think I'm more, I'm more interested in that. Like, how do you feel about it? Like, how, how does it make you feel? I think that's a far more powerful evoking uh, tool to, uh, to, to use in terms of when we think about cinema or architectural design, you know, how, how does that building of space make you feel? So I've been really fascinated behind just, just, just how you feel. Right. Well, Corday, thank you again. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you were able to join us today for this lecture series. I look forward to seeing the work that you're doing now at uh, ONX. I, please let me know when we can bring you back. 
Uh, and having said that, I will uh, draw a, a close to, to this presentation and also to what turned out to be a lengthy interview with you, the artist. Thanks, Al. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. And I uh, hope you're well. Uh, take care, um, especially tonight in West Philly of, of all nights.